John chapter 15. When Pastor Ryan told me my text for today, and um, he even gave me a sermon title, I, I thought for a minute and I said, uh, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> this text is not what you would normally would go to for a New Year's Day uh, sermon. Uh, matter of fact, the, the text is very somber and it's very sober. Um, it's very serious. And it's very relevant, not just for the day the disciples were in, but also for today. So if you're there in John chapter 15, follow along as I read. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, it's with great joy that we open your word and we look into the words of Scripture. We pray the Spirit of God will open our hearts and our minds to the truth that you want each of us to hear, to learn, and to apply into our lives. Father, we pray that you would give each one of us in the room the spirit of a martyr. I pray, Father, that you will impress upon each of our hearts the reality and the relevancy of what we're going to talk about this morning. Help us to put out the distractions in our minds. Help me, Father, to focus. I pray you'd give me energy and that you would show yourself strong on our behalf, God. We cry out to you and we hunger and thirst for you. We love you so much, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Anybody here read that book? It's rather interesting, isn't it? Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us of Ignatius of Antioch, his martyrdom in the Roman Colosseum by the wild beasts in 107 A.D., it tells of Polycarp of Smyrna who was burned at the stake in A.D. 155. In A.D. 165, Justin was beheaded. Later, Telemachus was run through with the sword while protesting the bloody violence of the gladiatorial fights in the Colosseum. From the death of the apostles to the present day, Christians have lived out the truth that we read at the end of Hebrews chapter 11. You remember these words where it describes family, those bought by the blood of Christ. It says, some were tortured, 
refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Wow. This is the subject that Jesus is teaching his disciples in the upper room in John chapter 15. Jesus, by now, it's, been a, it's already been a couple of days. If you read back in the previous verses, chapter 13, 14, beginning of chapter 15, Jesus has, has taught the disciples the importance of being a servant. He washed their feet and then told them that, that the, the servant is not greater than his master. And, and, and then he taught them um, about the Holy Spirit, the, the other helper who was to come and, and uh, would be the, the distinguishing factor in their lives to come and in their empowerment for understanding the word and for ministry. And he taught them about the importance of abiding in the vine, that ever-present uh, day in and day out, moment by moment uh, relationship with the Savior himself. And then he ends chapter 15 by, by, by shifting gears and, and, uh, and, and explains to them what their lives are going to be like after he leaves them. And here's how he describes it. Verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it's hated you. What a way to describe what the future is going to look like for you and for me if the world hates you, it's going to hate you because it's hated me. And this is a strong word, the word hate. And uh, this has characterized the church over the centuries. Um, the, the world has, has encircled the, the church of Jesus Christ and, and sought to, to, uh, to break it apart and to kill it and to take the heart away from the church. We've all read articles, heard stories of how the church has been treated over the centuries. A few facts that maybe some of you have heard before. In 1996, they estimate 160,000 believers were martyred and countless others across the world were subject to unimaginable horrors. The World Mission Digest states that there are close to 100 million martyrs just in the 20th century alone. In, the, in that famous book called By Their Blood, which was almost like a sequel to Fox's Book of Martyrs, we're told that there have been more people martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ in the 20th century than in all previous 19 centuries before. I, it's hard for me to wrap my arms around all of these statistics. I don't know about you. The Religious Liberty Commission says more people have died in circumstances related to their faith in this century than in all the wars combined in the 20th century. And there were two world wars and countless other localized wars. In Pakistan, there was a law recently passed it's called the blasphemy law, and here's what it says. It forbids speaking or acting against the prophet Muhammad. The punishment for doing such is death. And so a 12-year-old Christian child was arrested for proclaiming faith in Jesus Christ. The child was sentenced to death under this law. Fortunately, by heavy international pressure, the child was released, but now the child is in hiding in a Western country with a bounty on his head. Can you imagine that? Being 12 years old and having a bounty on your head? The United Nations reports that the militant Islamic government of Central African Sudan has declared a systematic battle against Christians. Since 1982, 300,000 Sudanese Christians have been killed. Each year, hundreds of Christian believers are sold into slavery and taken where they have to work as slaves or as concubines for their Muslim masters. 
only because they claimed faith in a man who they claim to be God, who has changed their life. In, in China, a 22-year-old Christian evangelist, listen to this, was at a meeting It was of one of the house churches, which is a non-government sanctionized meeting. He and four other evangelists were seized by the agents of the Public Security Bureau, which is China's KGB. In front of the congregation, these four evangelists and others were severely beaten. The security officers next handed the rods to the congregants and, and ordered them to, to beat their leaders. And if they refused, then they would be beaten badly as well. The, the 22-year-old pastor was beaten so bad that he, they were afraid he would die right there. And so they released him. And the story goes on that he crawled and hobbled for several miles attempting to reach his home, but finally collapsed and died on the road. And such persecution is commonplace. It's commonplace in China Last year, we, we prayed. We prayed for, for Saeed Abdinini. Do you, do you remember when we prayed for him and he was ultimately released uh, this past fall? He was a pastor who wanted nothing more than to help his people in Iran to build orphanages. But, but no, he was arrested and given a jail sentence of eight years and placed in the worst prison in Iran. He was tortured and beaten, not just by the guards, but by prisoners as well. All because he proclaimed faith in the fame of the name of Jesus Christ. These men and these women are our family. Have you ever thought about that? When you ever hear of Christians being, being persecuted and tortured and martyred for the name of Jesus, they're family and when I began to think on this, it, it revolutionized my, my relationship to these stories. And now I, and I begin to take them personal. You see, there are blood brothers because they've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Just like you have, I hope. We're all in the same family. And, and they're being murdered, tortured, and persecuted and we can only imagine the unimaginable horrors that go on because they simply name the name of Jesus. Somebody said that we live in the age of the martyr. That's not been said in, of any other century, but it's being said now. We live in the age of the martyrs, but actually this age began with, with our Savior, didn't it? That's why Jesus said in John 15, verse 18, if, if they hate you, they do so because they hated me first. So we're going to look in these verses briefly, and there's, there's three different, uh, uh, actually, I, I call them startling uh, statements that we're going to pull out of these verses um, that, that are going to startle you. They startled me, and the first one is this. Listen to this. We learn from these first several verses, don't be surprised by persecution. You say, I, I'm not surprised. I read about it all the time. But did you know that persecution, the kind Jesus is talking about, also happens here? And the kind that we read about over the oceans is ultimately going to be here in America. Do you believe that? Did anybody say amen to that? Amen. Because it's coming our way. And so we've been given a warning by Jesus in these verses to be prepared for what's coming. And so don't be surprised when you hear about persecution. And, and so that's why Jesus says, hey, the world hates you. It hates, it hates you because it hated me. So this word hate is an interesting word. It, it, means, it means to hate. <laughs> but, it, but it means not just to hate. It means to detest someone a, but it's an aggressive word that gives the idea of pursuing with this detestable hatred. It's not enough to say, I, I hate you. I hate what you believe in. I hate who you believe in. It's not enough to say that. This kind of hatred now will pursue you. It'll follow you to try to steal, kill, and destroy you. 
because this kind of hatred originates with the evil one himself. And that's the, that's the idea that Jesus is trying to tell his disciples. He's saying, guys, here in a matter of days, I am going to be gone. And after I leave, this is what the world is going to be like for my followers. And it's not going to be pretty. Now, the, the idea and the picture of this kind of hate is found in the story of Cain and Abel. And this being January 1st, I, I've determined, and you can hold me accountable, I'm going to read the Bible through this year. Matter of fact, I have a 90-day Bible. You read 12 pages a day, and you get through it in 90 days. So I'm going to read the Bible through four times. That's what I've determined. So this morning I got up, and I opened it up, and I'm reading in Genesis, and there's the story of Cain and Abel. It just fits right in. You remember Abel offered a sacrifice that pleased God because it was a blood sacrifice. And Cain offered a grain sacrifice because he was a worker, a tiller of the ground. And God was not pleased with the, the sacrifice that Cain offered. And so God approached Cain and he told him, if you, if, if you will do well, in other words, if you'll confess and forsake your sin, you will prosper. He says, you'll, you'll be accepted if you'll, if, you'll, if, if you'll offer the sacrifice I expect. And, and Cain got angry and the sin that was crouching at the door leaped upon Cain and it, it took over his heart and he became angry at Abel. Really, he was angry at God, but he took it out on Abel. And this is the kind of hatred that Jesus is talking about in here that, the, that his followers can expect in the world. You see, Cain told Abel, hey, let's, uh, let's go out to the field with me. Cain was pursuing Abel with this detestable hatred. And he pursued Abel out in the field and <laughs> took him down and killed him. And, and so this is the kind of hatred that God's people have experienced ever since Jesus said, this is what the world's going to be like for you. Terrible. Have any of you ever experienced that kind of hatred? At my last church, uh, we had a, a woman who was faithful, loved Jesus, elderly woman, and she came to church, but her husband never came with her. Then one day, after my wife and I had been at the church, I think probably about three years, we'd been praying for him, and he came to church. And I, we were rejoicing and thought he was fantastic. So I took another elder with me, and we decided to do a home visit and uh, see if we could engage him and challenge him to, if he had trusted Christ and just get in that whole scenario and try to evangelize him. We went to his home, and he was sitting out on his back deck. And so we went out around the house and found him back there. We sat down with him, just tried to bring up conversation. Before I knew it, he got up from his chair, and I was kind of standing by a chair. He got up, and he forcibly pushed me up against the, the rail of the deck. And, 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 he, and he did this with his, with his hand. I thought he was going to deck me. And I asked him, I said, why? What did, what did I say? What did, what did I do? And he told me, he said, this is for all of the time that you, that my wife came home from church and tried to convert me. And, and um, the other elder and I, we, we left rather quickly. And uh, that just really, I never had that happen before. And I really felt that he really hated me. And, and consequently, we never saw him come back to church again. And, I, and so that, that was one incident that, I, that it was really clear in my mind um, that I felt real hatred towards me. And I thought I was going to actually uh, spill some blood over that one. Um, but I don't know if you've ever experienced this. This is, this is scary stuff, isn't it? We read about it. It's, it's, it's beyond an arm's reach, but it's coming here. And it is already, in fact, here in various ways. And so there's two... Uh, there's two reasons that Jesus gives for this kind of hatred. The first one is because the world resents God's people. Verse 19, we look in verse 19. If you were of this world, the world would love you as its own, implying that unbelievers or, or that the believers are not of this world. Okay, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of this world and I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. 
The, see, the w- people who are not saved, who don't have the spirit of God inside of them, the Bible calls them the natural man. They're, they're in an unsaved, depraved state, lost in their sins. And these individuals who are not saved, when they see that, that you know, they say, well, you're so arrogant because you think you know you're going to heaven and you know God, when in fact we do, by the grace of God, through the spirit of God, because of the word of God, through the preaching of the word of God, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When, we, when, when the world sees this, they resent us for it because it makes them think that we are better than they are, but that's not what this is all about. And so there's a, there's a resentment, this negative attitude. And and then, and then there's this ignorance that unbelievers have. Look in verse 21. There's this ignorance. But all of these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. And then look in verse 25. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. There, there's, there's ignorance. They, they don't... They don't know. They, they think that ignorance is bliss. And there's a story, a little brief story that I, that I found. And l- listen to this. It's, it's about a Denver woman who told a pastor of a recent experience that she felt was indicative of the times we live in. And she was in a jewelry store looking for a necklace. And she said to the clerk, I'd like to have a gold cross. So the man behind the counter looked over the stock in the display case and held a necklace up and said, do you want this plain one, or do you want this one here with the little man on it? And you look at, you think about that for a minute, and go, well, that's kind of funny, but actually it's not, because the one with the little man on it reveals that there's a lot, there's ignorance. He doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to religious things, right? And and people in the world who, who, who are part of the congregation that, that will grow if they don't already to hate believers, um, have a resentment underlying their hatred, and, it, and it's also founded upon an ignorance because they don't really know what they're talking about. And, and so this is the, the platform that Jesus is telling the disciples, don't be surprised if you get persecuted because this is what is out there. And I think um, we, we kind of understand, we, we've kind of seen that in our own little ways. The second startling statement in verses 26 and 27 is, don't be silenced by persecution. Now, we're laying a foundation here. Don't be surprised by persecution because the world hates us, because they really hated Jesus first, so they hate us too. But when persecution comes, don't let it silence you. Don't let it shut your mouth, okay? Look in verses 26 and 27. When the helper comes, here's the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Remember, he's talking to believers here. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. These disciples have been with Jesus, his whole earthly ministry. He started out this whole text laying the foundation. Don't be surprised if the world hates you because they hated me first. And so they're, because they hate you, they're going to persecute you. They're going to want to do bad things to you. Um, but, and when they do, don't let that persecution silence you. Why? Because we have the helper, we have the comforter, we have the difference maker, we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah, right? We have God himself. Do you, I mean, do you really believe this? I'm, I'm asking you guys. Do you really believe that God himself lives inside of you once you confess your sins, embrace what Jesus did on the cross for you, and and become gloriously born again? And then God says he sends his Holy Spirit, he comes and indwells us and, and seals us into the day of redemption. Hallelujah. I mean, that's 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 God himself in, in, in the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity. And, and so because he lives in us, we can't be quiet. What happened to the disciples? 
They're in the upper room in Acts chapter one. They didn't understand a lot of this teaching because they had a lot of questions for Jesus in those first several verses of Acts chapter one. Then Jesus takes them to the Mount of Olives and he ascends into heaven. The disciples go back to the upper room and they, they, they worship and they pray, but they keep themselves hidden in secrecy from the authorities because they feared the, for their lives. And then what happens in chapter two? The Holy Spirit comes. This is exciting, you guys. The Holy Spirit comes and, and indwells them and they change. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're radically, drastically different. Matter of fact, they can't hold it in. <laughs> they, they, Peter starts preaching, and there's reason to believe that the others in that upper room, there were 120 of them up there, they all had the tongues of fire that came and sat upon them, and they all began to speak in other languages. It wasn't just Peter, and uh, there was tremendous preaching. Why? Because the helper, the comforter, lives inside of them. And so Jesus is, is reminding the disciples he says, when the helper comes, whom I, who I will send to you from the Father, um, he's going to bear witness about me. And, and, be, and, and, and then you also will bear witness. And, and so there's, the world hates him. Persecution starts to happen. And then Jesus says, the Holy Spirit He's going to come and live in you, and then you're going to bear witness of me. <laughs> so don't be surprised when persecution happens. And when it does, don't be silenced by the persecution. And so as persecution intensifies, listen to this. Our witness for Christ takes us into uncharted and dangerous territory. This boldness from the Spirit will become all the more necessary for us. Should we succumb to the pressures applied by the world to silence us, we will only have to look as far as our own faith to see where the failure lies. Now listen to this story. During China's Boxer Rebellion of 1900, okay? If you're a history buff, you've probably read about this. Insurgents captured a mission station. They blocked all of the gates but one. And in front of that gate, they placed a cross flat on the ground. Then the word was passed to the 100 people inside the mission station that any who trampled the cross underfoot would be permitted to leave and they would have their freedom and, and their life would be saved. Any refusing to trample on the cross would be shot by a firing squad. Terribly frightened, the first seven students stepped on the cross and were permitted to go free. The eighth student, a young girl, refused to do so. Kneeling beside the cross that was on the floor, kneeling beside the cross in prayer for strength, she arose and then moved carefully around it. And she went out to face the firing squad. She was dead. Emboldened by her example, every one of the remaining 92 students followed her to the firing squad. What would you have done? You see, when God the Holy Spirit has control of you, you will do what God the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Wouldn't you? Courageously preach in word and deed. Do not be silenced when you're at the restaurant and it's terribly busy. Will you take each other's hands and pray over your meal? When will, will you go to your neighbors and share the word of God with them? Will you try to engage your coworkers in, in Bible study where they can receive the truth from the scriptures and the spirit of God can bear witness with their heart that they are sinners in need of a savior? Will you do those things in the midst of persecution? Jesus says, don't be silenced. And then he says, number three, don't be sidetracked by persecution. Look in chapter 16. Beginning of verse one, I've said all of these things to you to keep you from falling away. Another translation terms it to keep you from being ensnared. In other words, when persecution comes, Jesus has given us a warning. I've told you all of these things so you won't become ensnared. So you won't uh, become a, a stumbling block. And, and the the... the, the a detailed Greek understanding of this is talking about closing on something like a spring-loaded rabbit track pulling you backwards into a trap. 
Now, what happens with these traps? If you know anything about trapping, they pull you into part of the trap. Uh, sometimes a gate will shut. Other times a, a, a device will, will slam upon your legs and break your bones and disable you. Why? Because they don't want the rabbit to get away or the, the rodent to get away should the gate or the trap somehow come loose. This is exactly what the evil one wants for us. He wants not only to, to entrap us in, in a, in, in, in the, to encase us in or wall us in, but then he wants to disable us and cause, cause maybe psychological or physical or both kind of damage so that, so that we cannot go forward and we cannot break loose. And, and he, wants to, he wants not just to, to steal our joy, he, he also wants to, to, to kill our drive and our motivation. And then he wants to, he wants to rip our heart out from us and, 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 and totally destroy us. And then if that's not enough, then he wants to trample on top of us. You see, that's what the evil one wants to do to the church of Jesus Christ to get them to shut up about the message of salvation, the message of God's love. And that's what Jesus is preparing his disciples in telling them this. You know, some of the worst persecution happens inside the church. Look at what Jesus said. He said, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. I told the first service this morning, some of the most difficult encounters that we have at some of our elder meetings is when we encounter other people from inside our congregation who are, who are bent on, on rebelliousness in their heart and, and, and they ca it causes a lot of harm and, and it's very injurious to not just themselves but to others and we, we confront that and it's, it's very difficult when, when Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cramer was burned at the stake, they preached a sermon prior to his execution. you imagine that? <laughs> uh, but Jesus is warning his disciples so that they will stand. How many people here have read the book by Randy Alcorn called Heaven? Isn't that a great book? It's, it's, it's incredible with the depth and insights that he brings out. Well, listen to what happened to, to Randy. He was a, a pastor and author, and in 1990, he was serving a large church, uh, making a good salary. After opening his home to a pregnant teenager who eventually came to Christ and had her baby, Randy participated in a peaceful, nonviolent protest of an abortion clinic. He was arrested and sent to jail, and, and the clinic won a court judgment against him and his group. And Randy told the judge this. He said, that he would pay any fine, but he would not hand money over to people who destroyed human life. Well, the judge informed him that they were going to garnish his wages, and one-fourth of his wages would go un until the fine was paid. So to prevent this from happening, Randy resigned his position at the church, and he took a job paying him minimum wage so he wouldn't have to pay the fine. Now, does that seem fair? No, it doesn't. But the story goes on that Randy never complained. Matter of fact, he saw God's hand in this whole thing. And I wondered, boy, I wondered if I would react that same way as Randy did. What would you do in that situation? Would you give God the glory? Randy did. I want to I wanna conclude my message today with, with five New Year's resolutions. Five New Year's resolutions to help you prepare for persecution. Because in 2017, it's coming in one form or another, in, in, in one way or multiple ways, between the world, the flesh, and the devil, persecution is going to come into your life and the life of our church. There will be persecution. Just ask Dick and Betty Odegaard, who we bought this building from. Persecution still follows them to this very day. They continue to receive emails and, and Facebook messages of, of hatred towards them. They continue to be pursued with that detestable hatred. They, they won't be left alone. And I tell you what, we are going to experience, you're going to experience persecution in 2017 in one way or another. Here's five New Year's resolutions to help you be prepared. The first one is to rely on the Holy Spirit. I didn't hear any amens. <laughs> Amen. Rely on the Holy Spirit to supply wisdom, ability, and courage. Why did Jesus mention the Holy Spirit in verses 26 and 27? Because 
the disciples were looking for something to hang their hat on. They weren't getting good news by Jesus. And they were like, well, what do we do in the midst of all of this? And Jesus reminds them about the comforter. He who fills their lives, leads their lives, guides them, instructs them, enlightens them, convicts them, keeps them on the straight and narrow. He is the difference maker. Rely on the Holy Spirit. This year, take a study in your own personal devotion life. Learn about God, the Holy Spirit. Who is he? What does he do? What does he do? Why does he do it? How can I be filled with him? What does this all mean? How do I walk with him? How do I be empowered by him? Take a study. Rely on the Holy Spirit, the first New Year's resolution. The second one is to faithfully proclaim the divine truth. Faithfully proclaim it. Verse 27 of chapter 15, you also will bear witness. There as it is, Jesus is saying, I've sent the comforter. He lives inside of you. Now you must faithfully bear witness of me, of the truth. When persecution comes and it's coming, maybe you're already experiencing it. Rely on God, the Holy Spirit, to help you through, to lead you on all truth, to give you direction, and, and continue to proclaim the message in word and in deed. The, the third New Year's resolution is to never forget that persecution and the rise of evil are inevitable. Don't think for a moment that, hey, maybe I'm going to miss it this year. Uh, it's not going to happen to me. Yes, it will when you least expect it. It's, it's coming. That trap is being laid and he, Satan wants to snare you and he wants, to, he wants to disable you in that snare and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy you and then trample upon you. Keep, faithfully proclaim, never forget the persecutions rise. And then the fourth one, keep from being ensnared. Keep from being ensnared. Chapter 16, verse 1, I've said these things to keep you from falling. Order your life in a disciplined way so that you will avoid any and all appearances of evil that could possibly ensnare you in that trap. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. Stay in fellowship. Be faithful. Hold yourself accountable. Hold others to make you accountable. Do whatever you got to do to keep from being ensnared. You understand that? This, these, are, these are godly uh, New Year's resolutions. And, and then the fifth and final one is to abide in the vine. Ryan passed, preached an awesome message a couple weeks ago. Abiding in the vine. We bear fruit from the vine. He prunes us. He keeps us healthy. It's that day-to-day, moment-by-moment, vibrant relationship with God the Son. Hallelujah, through his word. Abiding in the vine. To know Christ is to have eternal life. Did you know that? And, and this is worth everything. And these words about persecution, they're not meant to foster a defeatist attitude. No, 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 no. But to strengthen our spiritual resolve and to, to keep us ready and prepared because it's coming. Let me hear you say, it's coming. It's coming. Let me close with this story. In ancient Rome, listen to this story. In ancient Rome, crowds by the tens of thousands would gather in the Colosseum to watch as Christians were torn apart by wild animals. So a man by the name of Paul Radar, commenting on his visit to this famous landmark, said this, I stood uncovered to the heavens above, where he sits for whom they gladly died. And I asked myself, Would I, could I die for him tonight to get this gospel to the ends of the earth? Radar continued, I prayed most fervently in that Roman arena for these three things. Listen to this. I prayed that God would give me the spirit of a martyr. I prayed that God, the Holy Spirit would work in my heart so that God would, would form me and, and conform me to the image of his son. And then I prayed that God would work in me so that I would have the same attitude as those martyrs had, the attitude of living life on the threshold of heaven, the attitude of living my life within a heartbeat of home, the attitude of living my life so that no possessions would hold me back. That's what he prayed. 
Do you have that spirit of a martyr in you? Do you live life with that attitude of, I'm living on the threshold of heaven? I'm living life so that no possessions would ever hold me back. I don't need anything. I just run after my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Is that you? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? When was that time when you recognized your lost state, being a natural man, don't have the spirit living inside of you, if you're ignorant, you, re, you have resentment towards other people who claim to know God? Do you know Jesus? This morning, I challenge you to embrace him, his work on the cross for you. He's, his blood was shed. He paid the penalty for your sin. He satisfied the, the righteous judgment of God. And, and God approved of his sacrifice with an exclamation mark. He raised him from the dead, showing his approval of that sacrifice. And everyone who believes that he is the Lord and that he has risen from the dead will be saved. Is that you? If that is you, praise the Lord. Now, say, God, give me the spirit of a martyr. God, give me that attitude that I live life on the threshold of heaven and that no possessions would hold me back. Father, we pray this morning for just that, that you might so work in our heart, convict us of, of our sin, of selfishness, of rebelliousness, whatever it is, God. And if there's anybody here who's never surrendered their heart and their life to Jesus Christ, that this morning they would embrace him as their savior from sin and enter into an abiding relationship with the Son of God himself, and the Holy Spirit that would come to live within him. And then we pray for the rest of us, and then all of us, Lord, that this new year we would take a look at these resolutions, and by your grace, you would apply them into our lives so that we would be prepared. And when persecution comes, we would bring you glory and honor in how we live through it. We love you. We thank you so much. In the name of Jesus, everybody said.